Hello friend, this short video you're about to see is representative of what's going on today. It shows an Anglican church that has switched over to Catholic. There's a beauty to the Mass, the music, the incense, the liturgy, the reverence. All of these come together bringing us closer to God here at St. Luke's Catholic Parish. We are part of a nine geographical diocese known as the Personal Ordinariate of the Chair of St. Peter, established by then Pope Benedict XVI in 2011. The main purpose of the Ordinariate is to bring Anglicans home to the Roman Catholic Church. But our liturgy is truly unique. It is where the sacred meets Elizabethan English. Being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. If you want to see the Latin rite preserved within the English language, if you want more than a Sunday obligation, but rather a taste of heaven, if you hunger and thirst for a Mass, where everyone turns to face Jesus in the tabernacle and receives the most holy sacrament, kneeling, this is the Anglican use. This is where the Latin meets English. This is St. Luke's Catholic Church. Inside today's Sunday Law News Report, we'll try to explain a bit more of what's taking place around the world in the bold moves of the papacy to have Protestants return to the Catholic fold. My name is Brent Winfield, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and this is the Sunday Law News Report. Christian unity has become the focus of most Christian churches today. The current attempt of Christian churches to band together in things in which they hold common is often referred to as ecumenism. Well, what is ecumenism? This word is defined as the organized attempt to bring about the cooperation and unity of all believers in Christ. The foundation for this ecumenical trend has been laid and built upon over many years. We first saw the beginning of institutional ecumenism back in the 1960s with the formation of the World Council of Churches, which at first consisted of mostly mainline Protestant denominations. But the largest Christian church, however, the Roman Catholic Church, with about one billion members is still not officially a member of the World Council of Churches. Until the 1960s, one could not really be a good Catholic and be ecumenical. In 1964, however, the Roman Catholic Church officially stepped into the ecumenical age. In that year, the Second Vatican Council adopted the decree on ecumenism which says, that all who have been justified by faith in baptism are incorporated into Christ. They, therefore, have a right to be called Christians, and with good reason, they are accepted as brothers by the children of the Roman Catholic Church." End quote. The decree also refers to non-Catholic Christians as separated brethren. The Catholic ecumenical position is simple, friend. The separated brethren ought to accept the supremacy of the Pope and either become members of the Roman Catholic Church or join hands and continue their existence as separate entities within the framework of a fraternal religious system. Now, several years ago the Church revised the Catholic liturgy and have updated the Church in several areas in an effort to bring the Protestant back into the fold. For example, Protestants are no longer called heretics by the church. Instead, the attempt to togetherness by distributing each year millions of leaflets entitled Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. Every Sunday, ecumenical worship services are held around the globe. And in 1991, for the first time in history, the Pope held an ecumenical service with two Lutheran bishops at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The former Pope, Benedict XVI, had at that time 
declared his commitment to the Second Vatican Council's approval of ecumenism. Mm. Well, back in March 29, 94, leading evangelicals and Catholics signed a historic joint declaration called Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium. This 25-page document was signed by 40 well-known evangelicals and Catholic leaders, including well-known conservative Christian TV personality, Pat Robertson. At present, there are two main ecumenical organizations. One, the World Council of Churches, or the WCC, and then there's the National Council of Churches, or the NCC. Today, 349 churches with more than 560 million members belong to the World Council of Churches, whose administrative center is in Geneva, Switzerland. Now, friend, here's an example which illustrates how far the idea of togetherness has progressed. During Pope Benedict's trip to the United States in 2008, representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, yes, the Mormons, were invited to attend an ecumenical prayer service with the Pope for the very first time. The Mormons, of all people. And recently, Pope Francis presided over a service at the Basilica of St. Paul's outside the walls in the United Kingdom with Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, and other Christian representatives. They were all present there. Saint, do you see how it's all coming together? In a previous Sunday Law News report, I showed you how Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, and others are all working with the Pope for global unity. In 1988, Ellen G. White wrote the following, and I quote, Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism. She goes on to say, they will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. See Great Controversy, page 588. Friend, in, 19, in 1885, when she wrote this, the ecumenical movement as we know it today was not even thought of. At that time, not only were Protestants quarreling amongst themselves, but they were most passionately opposed to the Roman Catholic Church back in those days. Well, not so today. Today, they're all rushing back to Rome. Now finally, here's the official position of our denomination on this matter of ecumenism. It's a quote taken directly from the church website entitled, Documents of Official Statements of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I quote, Generally, it can be said that while the Seventh-day Adventist Church does not completely condemn the ecumenical movement, and its main organizational manifestation, the World Council of Churches, she has been critical of various aspects and activities. The Seventh-day Adventist Church begins by, quote-unquote, calling out God's children from fallen ecclesial bodies that will increasingly form organized religious opposition to the purposes of God. Together with the calling out, there is a positive calling in to a united, worldwide, that is, ecumenical movement characterized by faith of Jesus and keeping the commandments of God. In the World Council of Churches, the emphasis is first of all on coming in to a fellowship of churches, and then hopefully and gradually coming out of corporate disunity. In the Advent movement, the accent is first on, 
on coming out of Babylon coming out of Babylonian disunity and confusion and then immediately coming in to a fellowship of unity, truth and love within the globe encircling Advent family. Now looking back, Adventists see centuries of persecution and anti-Christian manifestations of the papal power. They see discrimination and much intolerance by state or established churches. Looking forward, they see the danger of Catholicism and Protestantism linking hands and exerting re religio-political power in a domineering and potentially persecuting way. They see the faithful Church of God not as a jumbo church, but as a remnant. They see themselves as the nucleus of that remnant and as not willing to be linked with the expanding Christian apostasy of the last days. How can Adventists best succeed in fulfilling the prophetic mandate? It is our view that the Seventh-day Adventist Church can best accomplish her divine mandate by keeping her own identity, her own motivation, her own feeling of urgency, her own working methods. The Seventh-day Adventist Church wants no entangling memberships and refuses any compromising relationships that might tend to water down her distinct witness." Hmm. End quote. And let the church say, Amen. Okay friend, let us pray now. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we have a distinct message. A message for this last days. A message, O oh Lord, that separates us, the remnant church, from the apostate church. Help us, O oh Lord, to recognize your Sabbath and keep it holy. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's it for today. May God richly bless you. And always remember that God loves you. Yes, he really, really does love you.